Thank you. I'm going to hopefully sit and be comfortable for a little bit. Uh, my name, like I said, is Gordy Russell, so I'll give you a brief introduction, a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about our company and what we do here locally, and then I'll let uh, these fine ladies talk a little bit about themselves too, and then we'll open up to answer any questions for you. I've been in the aerospace industry for 17 years, worked for the same company, but we've changed names, gosh, how many times, Katie? Five, ten times. So a lot of you, if you're from the local area, there were a lot of aerospace companies around here, uh, mainly here in the Salt Lake City area. There's a company back in the days called Hercules that later became ATK. They were mainly out in the uh, Magna, Utah area, West Valley City, um, West City, West Valley City, yeah, sorry. Um, and then there was a company called Thiokol, before that Morton Thiokol, uh, other names, Corton Technologies, uh, that was up at past Brigham City, a place called Promontory Point, way out almost close to where Golden Spike is, where the Trains came together back in the in the days, and uh, and then once upon a time we were competitors, and then we joined forces together and became uh, orbital or became ATK, and then uh, three four years ago we uh, we merged with a company called Orbital Sciences, became Orbital ATK, and then this uh, past year uh, we got bought out by Northrop Grumman, and so about that time we were about 15,000 employees across the world, and Northrop Grumman is about 69,000, so now we're about 84,000 strong. So the, the point of all that is, uh, is when we talk, we come from the, the Orbital ATK company, uh, even though we say we're from Northrop Grumman, so our heritage is, is pretty much here in Utah, where we've all uh, worked on programs here. Um, like I said, I've been with the company 17 years. I spent five years in the original Thiokol up north working on the space shuttle program, and then um, transferred over to start working on the, the last clip they showed you on the space launch system, the, the new vehicle that we're going to be sending up our astronauts back into space on. At that time, the company sent me down to Marshall Space Flight Center in northern Alabama. And it was supposed to be two years. I spent nine years there. And eventually, they, they dragged me back to Utah to work, uh, actually, an Air Force program. So one thing this video didn't show what we do a lot here in Utah is more than just NASA, NASA programs, commercial space programs. We also do a lot of Department of Defense, uh, other commercial vehicles, anything from what we're working on, uh, what I'm working on now. I actually, after 14 years of NASA programs, went to Air Force programs, working on big air, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, and other type of vehicles that take things around the world. And so that's, that's my background, and I'll let Katie and, and well, I want to call you Mo, but Diane talk about what, what their backgrounds, so. Thank you, hi, my name is Katie Kwan. I am right now the Senior Manager of Strategy and Business Development for our Propulsion Systems Group, which is mainly our Utah facilities here. Um, we have, I don't know, you didn't go through this real quick, but we have two large facilities um, that are propulsion systems. You said Promontory and Bacchus. We also have a third facility in our aerospace systems division that's in Clearfield. And so uh, between the three of them, we do have quite a presence here. Thank you. When I started, I've been in the industry about 13 years now, also with many different names, but the same company. Um, I started at Thiokol myself, and a little Backwards from your experience, I started off in our ICBM programs and our fleet ballistic missile programs um, when the shuttle was going up at Promontory and then switched over to the NASA programs when we started the Constellation program. And that's when we were developing the Ares-1 and the Ares-5 launch vehicles. Um, that's the program that President Bush was talking about when he retired the space shuttle in the film. Um, after that, I was the senior systems engineer on the SLS or space launch system. So I was responsible for developing all the original requirements and design constraints for the two large white boosters that are on the side of the space launch system. And those are the ones that provide the primary thrust during liftoff for that vehicle. The, I think it's over 3.6 million pounds of thrust. And so a big, we like to say we're a big part of getting that off the ground. So um, that's kind of my just heritage. A just, just a little. Uh, right now, I'm working on our next generation ICBM programs as well as our commercial programs. You saw in the film we were talking about commercial crew. There's also something called a crew car or cargo program that NASA is doing right now. Northrop Grumman is, uh, has a pretty big part on it. There's a capsule we built called the Cygnus capsule and it flies on our Antares vehicle. We had one launch last year in November. We have another one coming up next year and that's to get cargo missions, cargo like food and supplies, uh, not humans, but everything else that the astronauts up at the space station need. Um, and we do ferry flights back and forth from the sp 
the space station quite often. SpaceX with their Dragon capsule also does the same thing and soon to come up is also Sierra Nevada with the Dream Chaser vehicle. So a little bit of all of the parts of the industry. Um, hi everybody, um, my name is Diane Salmon. I have been with the company about two and a half years, so I'm not as experienced as these people over here. Um, they're amazing leaders, so I'm like, I'm really honored to just be invited and be on the same stage as them. But um, So my background is a chemical engineer, and I'm currently working on, um, well, commercial programs, but I'm working as a quality engineer. So, so far I get, um, well, e even though I am new to the company, um, I do get to experience um, all sizes of, um, of the company, from the commercial side to defensive side to, um, you know, um, like the NASA program, for example. So I have, I have get to see basically every program or m the majority of the programs we have here in Utah. And I think um, I'm just really happy to be a part of this, you know, and like seeing the movie. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm like truly inspired to, you know, um, be part of this in the next decades to come. So, yeah. We're, we're glad she's here and her excitement and enthusiasm. That's, that's why she's here. But uh, no, uh, um, as Katie said, so the last thing to, before we introduce the questions, uh, obviously our, our main background for what we worked on is solid rocket boosters. Like she said, the big rocket boosters on the sides of the, the shuttle and, and the SLS. Um, but we've got lots of other divisions of the company, even that build satellites, satellite structures, composite structures, airplanes, uh, lots of things, you name it. That's just not our background here on stage. But, uh, but we're still very excited. That's why we're still here working in the industry we are. We're in, uh, Mike asked me before when I was up there uh, sitting in the back, you know, what's my favorite thing? And my favorite thing is still to go out to our test launches where uh, it's not a launch, our tests, we'll strap a rocket booster, you know, horizontally on the ground just north of us here. And we test them here in Utah and we ignite them and we light them and, and they are so powerful. It it's rocks you to your core. If Katie and I are sitting this close to each other, by the, when the time the sound hits you, we have to scream almost at the top of our lungs just to talk to each other and say hi. It's that loud and, and that, that just keeps my excitement going and that and, and working with all the astronauts and people that we get to put in space. And so our bosses actually are former astronauts. They've been in space, so it's fun just to be around them and, and talk to them and, and listen to their stories. So that's, that's why we're here and we love to do this. So we can open up for questions. Yes. Okay, everyone was inspired ever since 2001 a Space Audience, uh, Space Odyssey, excuse me, especially engineers. Uh, it's clear from the movie <clears throat> that there are different kinds of missions, basically different kinds of missions, some that involve technology, wonderful technologies, monitors, all the uh, earth sciences, etc. And then there's putting people up there. Uh, what is the, and that probably comes down to the expenditure choices, which I assume get very difficult sometimes. And we, if you read the newspapers over the last couple of decades, funding NASA is very controversial. So when we make those decisions about we put men and people, men and women, of course, man's uh, missions compared to instruments, what's the difference in cost? What is a mission cost that puts a uh, instrument, a valuable monitoring instrument, mm. compared with a, a, a man or oh, woman, a space astronaut circling. What's the general order so, of magnitude of those costs? So I'll say what I do know, and then I'll let's see if Katie can answer some of that too. She's had some experience with some of this pricing, I think. Um, but in general, I will state that. NASA compared to the overall fiscal government budget. If for every dollar that we pay in taxes that goes towards uh, government programs, it's less than one fraction of one penny that goes towards NASA compared to the defense budget 
which is, gosh, what, 30, 40, 50, I forget the number, I'm gonna make it up, so don't quote me on this. But it's a, it's a fraction compared to other programs, and yet we see how many jobs and how many um, people, uh, programs and, and industry partners are created that can can work off that fraction of the budget. And yeah, but having said that, so what's the cost difference between sending a human up versus sending an instrument or something else up? I don't know if I really know the difference of that, but. I mean, I think it's fair to say that it is a significant portion more. We don't have a specific number. It depends on the instrument you're setting up and it depends on the person you're setting up. I mean, if you think about it in terms of cost, the things that would be included in a human spaceflight mission are not only the life support systems that associate that, that person, so uh, the Curiosity rover doesn't need oxygen and doesn't need mm -hmm. water as we're going out there. Um, more so than that, it doesn't require the training it takes to get those astronauts ready to go up. And I'm not just talking the training at NASA, but the training that led up to them being, a, you know, chosen by NASA such that they can go up in there. So, I mean, it depends on where you draw the line for where the cost is. It is a lot more. Um, I will add on to that just a little bit more commentary. So one of our friends is a astronaut, Mike Massimino, which uh, you might have seen, a, there was a little clip of him at the very end. He commanded several uh, shuttle flights. You might also See know him. See him on the Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory, yeah. <laughs> yeah he was Howard Wolowitz's uh, mentor as Howard was going up on the Soyuz. Anyway, so he, he's a real astronaut, and he was uh, one of the ones that flew right after the Columbia disaster, and he did the servicing mission for Hubble, the second Hubble servicing mission. And he talks about, he, he has a book out there called Spaceman, and in there he talks about the value of human spaceflight and what it is that a human can do versus what an instrument can do. Because at that time, when Columbia happened, you saw that was the second time that there was a major shuttle disaster at NASA, and they were seriously considering not returning humans to space. And so they had started putting together missions of robotics that can go up and service the the Hubble so that people didn't have to go up and do it again. And it, uh, one thing led to another. Anyway, it ended up that they ended up going up there and it was a complex system where they had, they, they went through years and years of training of how to you know pull the instruments out and put in the new uh, power supply and all that stuff. And they trained for hundreds if not thousands of hours. And when he finally went up there and did his spacewalk, um, there was one screw that just would not come out of 114 screws to get this panel off so they could put the, put the power supply in. And no matter what they trained for, all these hundreds of thousands of hours, there was no way that without him there, um, they could figure out how to get this one screw off so they could get the panel off and service that. And in retrospect, he was talking about we could have designed an instrument to try to go up there and do that. And we could have programmed thousands of scenarios and redundant scenarios and default scenarios but without that person there, there was no way that would have happened. And that just illustrated the, the value of human spaceflight you know, in that particular mission. And so the question is the cost of sending humans up versus the value you get of having that brain up there and having the ability to adapt to the situation, which no robot can do. All robots are by default programmed before they go up. You know, what is that value? And so I, that, that was just really a, a story that stuck with me. Okay, um, I kind of have a two-part question. I'm assuming that when you test your uh, rocket engines, it's, you're burning a fossil fuel, which you know adds to, the, adds to the pollution. So talk a little bit about that. And then also, is, are you guys looking towards maybe turning to hydrogen as a, a powerful force to, to save the environment and put you up in space with hydrogen? So can, can, I'll start by saying uh, when we burn our rocket motors, we actually don't use any uh, fossil fuels. No. The fuel that we used, it has to be a self-contained fuel because there is no atmosphere in space and, space and fossil fuels by default require oxygen for combustion. So the chemicals we use do not add to the fossil fuel problem, we are proud to say. <laughs> so first of all. <laughs> um, the second thing is your question about alternate fuels. That's a very good question. And um, technology and NASA, I mean, they've been looking at things from ion propulsion to plasma propulsion, electric propulsion, all those things, and there's been big developments. The problem is that the thrust it requires to exit weight, like what we're talking about, out of the atmosphere, those types of propulsion, including hydrogen, propane, kerosene, are very limited in the, the efficiency of the power. And so currently our technology for those types of applications are not quite there to use that. Now in space where there is no gravity, different story, we are using those types of things on our satellites and our capsules, that sort of thing. 
That's a good point. I, I want to touch on real quick is a lot of people always ask us since we're a solid rocket booster provider, solid rocket fuel, and compared to some of our competitors that make uh, rocket boosters that are made from liquid fuels, and they always want to compete with the government on what's the best. You know, solid rocket fuels, liquid, and in my mind, it's actually you need both. Like Katie just said, we really need the solid rocket fuel to get the amount of thrust we need to exit the Earth's gravity and to get going. But once you get out and farther away from the Earth and the, and the gravity is decreased in, in, in space, yeah, liquids are going to perform a lot better and, and we need those to get to where we need to go and to keep our speeds up in space. So I, I really think you need, need both. Uh, everyone always asks me what's better. I think they're both good So for different applications. Oh, yes. I was just wondering if uh, what's happened to the uh, fiber composite plant on 5400. Is that still a part, or is that spun off completely into some other division? It, it's still there. Uh, so it used to, what he's talking about, there's a, a, we did a lot of composite work as part of our company. Now we buy a lot of our com uh, those specific fibers. Uh, we, we sold off that piece of the company to another bigger fiber company, and uh, but we still use the same fibers from them that was we use from ourselves. So that the company's still there. They're just owned by a, a different company. Hexel. And do you know the name? Excel is the name of the company. Excel. Excel. Okay. Yeah. Oh okay, yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. You, you, as we said earlier, too, even our own company name changed so many times, the different owners, different <laughs> things. Uh, but we do, like Katie said earlier, too, just composites in general. We build a lot of structures, composite structures. Um, air paint, airplane skeletons, even down to some sporting goods, some golf clubs, and some other things. So uh, we we're dip our hands in a lot of different little things. So, uh, Hi, how you doing? Hi. Uh, I, I was wondering, is there any reason why the solids are built and fueled in segments and then assembled, you know, versus just having one monolithic uh, tube? Do you, Do you know? Sure. I, 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 I can take a jab at it. Yeah. Um, a, a thing is depend on the facility capacity. So essentially, um, at Promontory, we were able to have a large enough facility to build those segments of the SLS. Um, however, you know, if you can imagine, the SLS is, um, I mean, I'm probably going to butcher the diameter here, but it's like very, very large. 12 feet. 12 feet. Yeah. 12 feet in diameter. So, so with that said, it's like your, your limitation there is based on the physical capacity of the facility, so. So D Diane's correct, and then the other the second half of that is actually transportation from here to the launch facility. So since we build rocket boosters here in Utah to get the, the shuttle boosters and now the space launch system boosters down to Florida, they go on train and on rail. So we're actually limited by the diameter right now, pretty much to close to where we are in 12 feet in diameter. I mean, we can design a bigger rocket, uh, but if we design it, we're gonna have to go build a whole new plant and to go build it where we're gonna launch it from because we have to transport it there. Uh, in fact, earlier in, in, in the middle of the shuttle program days, they were looking at a more what they call monolithic, like you said, rocket booster, one big long booster, and they pour all the propellant in it at one time, and, but that was going to be down close to the Mississippi River where they can put on a barge, ship it down in the ocean, come around to Florida, and then, and then pull it up and stack it to launch from there. But yeah, after the uh, Challenger accident, they, they kind of scrapped that and, and decided to keep going with where they were. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Question. Can you talk a little bit about who you view as your competitors, <laughs> China, other <laughs> rocket manufacturers internationally? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so competitors. So there's, uh, it, yes, it depends on how you look at it. I think fundamentally um, when, I might be just naive or optimistic or whatever, when it comes to space launch, uh, Kind of like Charlie Bolden said in the movie, it, it makes you realize that the competition here, we're talking about whether it's corporation to corporation or nation to nation, is so terrestrial, it's so petty, right? Because the, the missions that we're trying to support are just existential. And so when you talk about competitors, um, depending on how you look at it, politically, yes, we have competitors in China and Russia, those types of things. Corporate-wise, we have other competitors like um, SpaceX and ULA and you know, other people, but, but when you look at the mission, I think it's a, it's a mission for humanity. I don't really see competitors. I, I'm, yeah, yeah, maybe a little. <laughs> Technologically speaking, 
Um, are you are you talking specifically for rocketry or exploration or rocketry? Rocketry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add a little more to that than to talk about that. So. You know, we work for a company that makes rocket boosters, and you're right, there's lots of other companies that make other designs of the rocket boosters. There's a lot of people who have money now are trying to jump into the game, you know, Virgin Galactic and others who people have money, they start their own companies. Um, there's differences, in, and I was talking to Mike before this too, there's differences in programs based upon if you're managed or have oversight from government agencies versus if you can do something on your own. I think that drives a difference. So I am all for competition. Uh, SpaceX out there competing with a lot of different uh, programs and vehicles that we want to, you know, compete against. Um, the thing to me is that um, if you're not working on the same programs of, with the same oversight, you have different rules. So the vehicles, a lot of them that we work on for NASA, not our commercial vehicles and other vehicles we do, we have to follow a lot more stringent rules with NASA, a lot more oversight, um, a lot more cost, um, because they're human-rated flight for, for NASA. And so we have to do a lot of things that SpaceX right now, where they don't have a human rated vehicle and they can, they're a commercial company and they can go off and do a lot of stuff their own. And I'm grateful for that because they, they're breaking a lot of barriers with technology and trying things that we don't get to try. Um, and, and unfortunately, we, we're in a society now or in a, in a time in, in the government programs with space is that we can't afford to fail with the government programs. But I think on some of these commercial ones, they, they're going to keep learning from their mistakes. Um, and, and we're grateful for, I'm grateful for what technologies they're, they're trying to test and come up with and unique ideas. Um, you know, just being able to land two rocket boosters back on ground, standing up, one's in the middle of the ocean on a barge, I mean, things like that. I, I don't get a try, so. <laughs> it's quite <I>, fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Isn't um, SpaceX looking at space tourism? I think there's a lot of companies looking at space tourism. Um, obviously, if you get enough people that have enough money to pay for it, um, it's not cheap, obviously, but trying to make it cheaper. In fact, on that, uh, on that point, by the way, we as a company, um, along with NASA and others, have tried to do what we can to make things more affordable. Because we see the value in space travel and, and all the things that we're able to learn. I mean, we haven't even touched on all the technologies that came out of the space program that I guarantee all of you have something that you're sitting with in your pocket or on the clothes that you're wearing, everything from, from Velcro to certain uh, zippers to your cell phones because of GPS in the sky. The, there's articles out there you can go look on the internet full of listing all the things that you wouldn't have today if we weren't trying to do the whole space race and space programs and all the technologies that we come up with because of those space programs. Um, so, I mean, there's so many things that I just enjoy from, from all this. So, I don't remember where I was heading with that, but yeah. When you were watching the testing of the, of the rocket engine, how close were you? And can the public witness it? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so you're so um, at the promontory facility where we test the rocket motors. Um, you're there's different test sites, but you're somewhere between one, to, one two to two miles away. So it's actually quite close when you're thinking about the amount of thrust. And yes, the public can see it. In fact, I think they do put out announcements um, that talk about when the test dates are and the test times are. It's usually around 1 p.m. is the standard test time on a Thursday. So whatever the week is, and you can come out and see it. The next one I think we're currently scheduled for is what we call the GEM-63 test. The GEM-63 is a booster we just developed for United Launch Alliance's Atlas V vehicle. Um, which is a space launch vehicle that's been flying for many years. That one's supposed to happen April 4th is the next one. So keep your eyes out for it. So if you go up I-15, I go up to the city of Corinne, the little exit for Corinne, just on the north side of Brigham City, and you take Highway 80, is it 83? 80. I think it's 83, and you go west, and you go about another 20 minutes west from there. And there'll be signs uh, for the viewing, but yeah, it's right off the road. We even got some parking lots we open. We have security people there that'll escort people in. And there's hundreds of cars, there's hundreds of school buses that come to every one of our, our test firings. And you just look up on the hill, and it lights up the hill when it ignites. Uh, when I was talking about uh, if I was sitting next to Katie and um, trying to talk to her and the, the feeling the thrust and hearing the, the sound, that's from that viewing, you know, one to two miles away. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, the first time I was there, when I first got hired by, on by the company, and, and I invited my wife, and she brought my, my, my baby son at the time up to the test firing, and it was, it was interesting to have a clock counting down, just like you're at a NASA, you know, an actual launch out of Florida, and I wasn't watching the clock, and I was, I was just watching, uh, talking to my wife and other friends around, and I look up and say, oh, look, it's fired, and, you know, there's fire coming out, and yeah, little did I know about, you know, I think it's what, five, six seconds yeah. later by the time the sound waves hit you, and then it's like, wow, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. It shakes your clothes. It's, it's yeah. pretty intense. <laughs> and like, I, I would also add that um, if you haven't seen it in person, I would highly recommend it. And like, you can search on YouTube, and it would not do justice at all um, in terms of the video, the sound feed. Because when you're there, I've, um, I, I guess I got the opportunity to go there um, for Gem 63 um, this past, um, let's see, couple, probably September 20th. Se September was a couple of um, months ago. But basically, you can sit there and you feel the vibration in the core. So like, it just shakes like the whole time, like you know how it burns. So a once in a lifetime experience for sure. Yep. Are, are the test firing subject to? Um, Yes. So are there constraints to our test launches here? There are some. They're not all the same as what you have for a launch, for an actual launch going to space. We're not going up. There's certain things we don't have to deal with. But we still have to deal with weather, especially winds, uh, higher up winds in the atmosphere. Uh, I mean, even though we're kind of out in the middle of nowhere up there, communities have continued to grow and come closer. And, and you know, a lot of people have, have fears that, you know, we, we're lighting up this, this rocket and you see all this, this plume of smoke coming in and then they think they're coming out and we've had people get on the news say, there's fallout, you know, like it's nuclear fallout. That's not the case. <laughs> Probably 90, 95% of what's pushed up in the air is just dust from the, from the mountain that we're shooting our rocket at. Um, you know, all our fuel is pretty much burned up. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, we, we do take that into consideration though, so that we don't want to drop on the farmer's crops, even though we're not going to ruin the crops. Uh, but we also have a lot of um, safety contingency plans in place. Uh, we'll go wash people's cars and, and, you know, sweep off their driveways to make them feel happy, even though we were there first. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, but we, do, we do take credit to make sure that we take care of the environment and take care of people. We don't want to cause any harm to anybody, but yeah, we do have some constraints. Do you have any testing that's done in Skull Valley still? Ooh, I don't know about that. It's beyond my time, so I guess no. <laughs> yeah. We should, have, we should have you come on stage with us too? No, you won't come? <laughs> so I have a question for Diane. Um, so this question is, so you have the GEM-63 test, but you also recently you had the escape... Um, launch I abort test. The escape right. launch test. Could you, would you be willing to comment on like, what you had to do in order to make sure that, that test actually took place? Like the static test or like the, the actual mission of that launch abort system? For you to be able to make that, like, take it how you will. So you, I'm, I'm just going to say that you're asking me you be behind the scene Yes. Type of deal. Yeah. Okay. And maybe also mention what the test is. Just. Okay. Sure. Exactly. And um. And, and we can help you. Can you yeah. Sure. I mean, I'll I'll take a jab at it, and these two will probably you know correct me or something like that. But, <laughs> but um, as a quality engineer, I do get a whole lot of hands-on with the motor. Um, as soon as it arrives at you know the facility, um, as an empty case with the carbon fiber. And then along the process when we put propellant in there and then of course when we finish and put instrumentation on the other end. So for launch abort system, for example, um, the configuration is very complicated and very different from other programs. So with that said, um, you, you just have to treat that as one of its kind. You, you cannot you know, just do a one size fits all for every program. So I guess for me, mentally, when I worked that program, which um, I, I did for a couple of months, basically, that program has many regulations. Um, I would say about the same level of, or may, maybe you know, very close to the government contracts um, in terms of the regulations and inspection or ex inspections. Sorry, inspections and so forth. So, with that said, um, I think the way we test it is um, we did our. We do static tests to understand the performance and understand if we have the right formula 
Do we have the right thrust in there? Um, do we have the right you know, material for the nozzle, for the composite, for the insulation, and so forth? So I think at the main, um, the final test would be the static test. Now, on the background side, we do a bunch of modelings and you know, software analysis. So with that said, we take, in the, um, take that data into account and you know, contribute to better overall performance in the future. So, so I'll help a lot of you out who don't know, obviously, some smart questions, but launch abort system is a system on top of the space launch system vehicle that's on very top of the capsule. So when Bush came out and announced that uh, we're retiring the space shuttle, it was based upon a whole safety uh, board report that came from the Columbia accident, and they determined it's safer for the astronauts to be on top of the vehicle, kind of like the old Saturn configuration, than strapped to the side like the space shuttle. And so that's one of the new constraints on the new vehicle is that they were trying to make sure they could put the astronauts on top. And so on top of them, there's another even really powerful smaller rocket booster that's made that if something goes wrong underneath them and the, the rocket boosters, the main engines below them, something's happening, something's blowing up, anything, that there's this other rocket engine on top that will pull their capsule away and pull them to safety. And, and it's very powerful to the point, I forget how many Gs it's putting on the body, but it's enough, I think it'll put all the astronauts to sleep, it won't kill them, but it'll put them to sleep as it's pulling them away with the forces, but it gets them away safely, so they can land back on Earth and, and continue on with future missions. But, so, Kate, um, Diane is right that there's a lot of testing that goes into that to make sure it works right, and a lot of behind the scenes analysis and everything they do, because it's a very important piece, so. Just have time for one more. Any one last question? I know we have one over there. There's someone with the hand there. You pick, I'm not picking. <laughs> yes, over there. Ooh. It's all you, Dan. Um, I'm just wondering we can, what we can do. Um, what can we do to save our future? <laughs> Told you, it's all you. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> what we can do to save the future? Yeah. Um, don't stop learning. Don't stop being curious about you know things around us. So I, I mean that's gonna be sound like that's gonna sound very vague, but I think it's so true because um, my background is you know in, in engineering. So with that said, I. It, it, this is gonna sound really nerdy, but like there's so there's so many times when I'm just like, oh, I wonder how you know this machine really works. For example, over break, I just you know um, help my parents replace toilet seats, you know, and like the, the system behind it's like, oh, there's fluid mechanics right here, this mechanical system in there, and so forth. So like things around the house, so not even just you know. Um, Big things like rockets, for example, right? So I think it, the curiosity and that energy will thrive and will basically put humanity in a better future. So I, I would say, you know, the, um, the the fact that we should continue learning and never stop. I'm actually I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really good answer, and um, you know, not just personally for ourselves, but if. We want to continue learning about the Earth to improve what we can do to preserve the Earth and make life on Earth better. We want to continue learning about the solar system to know, you know, what other options we might have um, as we continue to expand in the solar system, which will happen, you know, and uh, hopefully in the in, in your lifetime you're going to see it happen. So continue to pursue that knowledge is very important. Keep exploring. So if you watched in the video, right, we learned that yeah, in the end after. Talking about space exploration, we start learning. We're learning more about the Earth, and learning problems that we're even creating on the Earth and everything. But we're also learning some of the solutions to those problems. So we're designing satellites and other things that can go farther and learn about our solar system and our planet as much as possible, so we can help save it as well. Right? So I just keep exploring. That's what I'd say. <laughs> okay, one last one. Yes, <laughs> we have to go. Thanks Be quick. So Ourselves better and explore ourselves better. What has come from the space program? 
Oh. I'll let Katie think for a second. I, I, I'll get some quick answers. And some of it you saw in the video. So I was really excited when they sent Scott Kelly up into space, right? And he talked in there about he was there to study long-term effects. And for those of you who don't know the background to it, he has a twin brother astronaut who they kept on the ground, and they were almost identical, so they tried to do the same things and study their both bodies as one's in space and one's on the ground, okay? And so that alone recently, I mean, we learned so much from that. Like he says, theoretically, he could be up there 100 months and he wouldn't have any bones, right? Um, so we're, we're learning about being in space, but all that technology helps us understand things on Earth. I, I can't even begin to fathom all the, the things we've learned, but I know of how many, like they said, hundreds of of test experiments around the space station every year. It's unbelievable. Every shuttle mission that went up was taking up from everything from elementary schools to college ideas, experiments, and a lot of them even came from here from University of Utah from the medical side. There's a lot of medical experiments that they're doing in space. Like they said, they start to learn to understand how even aspirin that you take or other chemicals that, that they're trying to introduce, how they truly affect your body because they can, they can analyze that without the effects of gravity and other things. And so uh, I'm just making up answers now, but I, I watch some of the stuff I read. It's just, it's just, a, I mean, it's just amazing to watch every time they come back something that they learn. So, and in fact, it was unfortunate that the uh, Columbia accident, um, the Columbia accident, it, the, the Columbia never docked with the space station on purpose. It just orbited the Earth for several weeks, just doing experiments in, in the bays of the shuttle. And, and, and there was a lot of uh, technology I think that we could have gotten from that too. But uh, some of them, the point I was getting at was, it was amazing. Some of the experiments survived and came down the Earth and they were still able to get results from. So it was, it was great. So good things still come out of uh, failures and bad things. So. I'm sorry, folks, but the, we've stayed, overstayed our welcome. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Diane Kwan, or Diane Salmon, Katie Kwan, and Gordy Russell for their participation. And uh, if you'd like, maybe talk to them out in the lobby or outside of the building, uh, because the library is technically closed. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.